It is with great honor that I have the privilege to introduce this year's recipient, the James Madison Medal. This award is bestowed upon a graduate alum who has led a distinguished career, advanced the cause of graduate education, or achieved an outstanding record of public service. Robert Kahn of the graduate class of 1964 is truly a pioneer in technological advancement. In partnership with computer scientist Vincent Cerf, he conceived and developed the protocol for transmitting data between separate computer networks, which Dr. Kahn called interneting before the internet actually existed. Dr. Kahn's incredible contributions opened the door for an inconceivable proliferation of technological leaps and advances that continue to unfold today. After graduation, he joined the technical staff of Bell Laboratories before becoming an assistant professor of electrical engineering at MIT. Sensing an opportunity, he joined Bolt, Bernack, and Newman, where he was responsible for the system design of the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network, or ARPANET, and developed the first packet switch network. In 1972, he moved to DARPA, or the United States Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and subsequently became the director of its Information Processing Techniques Office, where he initiated the US government's strategic computing program, the largest computing research and development program ever undertaken in the United States. Today, Dr. Khan is chairman, CEO, and president of the Corporation for National Research Initiatives, a nonprofit organization that supports the national information infrastructure, or better known, as the information superhighway. Clearly, Dr. Khan has had an amazing career and is richly deserving of the title, the father of the internet. In addition to the Madison Medal and receiving an honorary degree from Princeton in 1998, Dr. Khan has been recognized with an impressive list of awards, including the 2013 Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering and many others. Dr. Khan's contributions to Princeton University have been profound. Serving as an advisor to the Department of Computer Science, President Eisgruber said, quote, Robert's scientific contributions have shaped the internet and his engagement with our Department of Computer Science has helped to establish Princeton as a leader in the field, end quote. In 2007, he established the Robert E. Kahn Star 64 professorship to support research and teaching of a tenured faculty member in computer science or electrical engineering, a professorship that is currently held by Professor Michael Friedman, who is with us here today. A revolutionary thinker whose work has ushered in not only a technological revolution, but also new ways of communicating. Dr. Khan's work has tirelessly been engaged to connect us all through a common language. We are honored to have him join us today. Please join me in welcoming Robert Kahn. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, Graduate Alumni Association, the administration and faculty of Princeton University for the honor of being this year's recipient of the James Madison Medal. It's particularly gratifying to be recognized by your peers and especially those who know you best. Thank you. 
My career has involved many years in public service, supporting research, but I've also had the privilege of helping to create innovative information infrastructure for the research community, for the military, and ultimately for all of society. My advisors at Princeton and the educational experience that was afforded me played a key role on that journey as it reinforced and greatly expanded my ability to think critically about technology and systems. And I was fortunately able to apply those skills to architecture and design and development writ large when few people even thought to do so at the time. So I'd like to focus my remarks today on a few of the important enabling aspects of my career that I relied on and some of the interesting challenges that I encountered along the way. But due to time limitations today, unfortunately, this has to be a highly abbreviated discussion. While much of my career has been in public service, my technical contributions all involve, to some extent, design and implementation of innovative infrastructure, such as the protocols for the internet, several packet switch network networks, applications such as packetized speech, now popularized as something called VOIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol, and more recently, a contribution that evolves the internet to embrace advanced information management techniques not just moving bits from computer to computer, but actually managing the information itself. Not everyone will agree on a definition of infrastructure, as there are a multiple dictionary definitions, such as the basic, I have to read this, the basic physical and organizational structures and facilities needed for the operation of a society or enterprise, or the basic systems and services necessary for a country or an organization to run smoothly, whatever smoothly means. <laughs> Examples of infrastructure that are often given are buildings, roads, transport, as well as water and power supplies. However, none of these definitions begin to come close to discussing information infrastructure which is intrinsically harder to visualize, much less to describe. Imagine trying to give someone a succinct definition of the internet. Some have said it's a network of networks without being clear about which networks are included and which are not. Indeed, there are challenges to be addressed even when technology is not involved at all. But in each case, there's a design aspect and presumably an implementation, which are usually addressed separately and sequentially, but occasionally can occur together, even if one or both are not even documented. The following description of internet management is not exact by any means, but it originate, originated with strong central control as exhibited by as exerted by the Defense Department, particularly the research agency known as DARPA. After a, a really interesting and productive period lasting several decades, during which time the internet evolved considerably, interest in the internet spread throughout the world. Following two world summits in the early 2000s, at which the issue of US control of the internet was a central concern, the immediate result was not the ceding of control by the US to anyone, to the extent it even had control at that point since it was so widespread and decentralized, but rather the creation of an internet governance forum, an oxymoron really, since its only goal was to foster discussion about the internet with no decision-making capability, which had little to do with governance at all. From strong central control, the internet now has very weak central control and is a widely decentralized system that's managed under a voluntary 
but cooperative compact among governments, industry, academia, and NGOs on governmental organizations around the world. In other words, to a very real extent, the internet evolved from a kind of strong federated system to a confederated one. You can view that as happening in different ways in different contexts as well. In the rest of my remarks, I would like to focus on identifying some of the challenges in creating information infrastructure that I personally experienced, although, as I said before, the time we have precludes me from going into how they were met. And then I'll close with some remarks about infrastructure support for semiconductor design and fabrication, as well as information management more generally. As many of you know, there were three initial packet switch networks in the nascent internet, and the internet protocols enabled them to be interconnected reliably along with their attached host computers. These are all examples of information infrastructure. As a government official, I, the challenge I faced at the time with the internet was convincing folks in the government that this was actually a good idea. Seems hard, seems hard to believe, but the question I encountered over and over was what existing military problem was the internet intended to solve? One regarded a very good imagination to process any answer since at the time there were essentially no examples to rely on. No embedded computers in military systems, few large batch processing machines in the DOD or the services, and they essentially had no interactive time-sharing computers to speak of. The ARPANET project was actually three related projects, creating a new kind of network based on communication of small address packets of information namely a packet switch net that was more efficient, more reliable, and more economic than the telephone network to enable computers of different designs to work together. Second, to determine how such computers could actually work together, which unleashed a new field of protocol design for distributed systems. And finally, how to make interesting use of such a powerful new capability, and particularly for sharing especially powerful computing resources that were not otherwise widely available, such as the few existing supercomputers, large data stores, and most importantly, sharing innovative software resources. That last topic is still a question of research today. I mention this because the term ARPANET means different things to different people, and I wanted to be clear about its constituent parts. My involvement in the ARPANET, which started me down this path uh, after graduating from Princeton and after my, my short uh, period at MIT, where I took a leave to get some practical experience, showed that I could do something. Um, so my involvement centered on the system design of the packet switch network. But I had little to do with the computer-based protocol developments other than acting as a liaison on occasion. Yet those protocols were not being developed by communication engineers, which I considered myself to be as well as a scientist. The protocol designers had assumed that the ARPANET would operate so as to deliver packets reliably. But clearly this assumption would not be viable after the introduction of wireless networks whose signals are more easily interfered with than with landlines. And but, you know, in support of what they actually did, it was not a given at the time that there would ever be more than one packet switch net, and that only for research. But still, as a communications engineer, I would not have made that assumption about reliability. Moreover, in an internet environment where packets need to traverse multiple networks, in principle, not necessarily all the same in order to get from source to destination, a protocol that only worked on one network, the ARPANET, would truly not suffice, and thus TCP IP was born. One issue considered in the ARPANET packet switch network design was whether or not deadlocks could occur, and if so, what to do about them. 
Dead war, deadlocks were like traffic jams in which all traffic stopped and would not restart without external intervention. I had strong views on this subject, but the argument was made by some that deadlocks involving packets, blocking other packets, were about as likely to occur as all the oxygen molecules in a room drifting to some far corner, causing everybody to suffocate. <laughs> so we didn't have to put fans in every room, just in case. This issue was addressed in early discussions about packet switch networks, but the proposal that was written, I actually wrote the technical part of it, and the initial design of the network never mentioned this subject at all. But in late 1969 or early 1970, that's over 50 years ago, while testing the initial four-node packet network that we developed, while at UCLA, I managed to lock up the network in the first 12 packets. <laughs> this resulted in a subsequent effort, not without controversy, to re-implement that aspect of the network so it wouldn't seize up in any subsequent public demonstration and afterwards during normal use, which is what I wanted to do from the start. At DARPA, I was prominently, in, prominently involved in two other networking programs, Packet Radio, which was originally envisioned to be like an ARPANET, lots of nodes, all of whom were mobile, or all of which could be mobile, and a satellite network using a single channel as a kind of ethernet in the sky to link to many, many parties that were distributed, potentially at sea, potentially uh, in other countries. Both were successful technically, but impacted the future in very different ways. The satellite network opened up serious international collaboration with our European colleagues that was not really possible with an ARPANET extension. I don't, I don't have time to explain the limitations here, it was a really interesting challenge, but that challenge was not technical. It was how to afford how to afford satellite access from any supplier at all. And when we started this, there were other challenges to be sure, but that was the, that was another topic. And frankly, uh, without any available domestic satellites, it was a real challenge. How we solved it involved help from another part of DCA and a careful reading of the legislation that involved the construct of CompSat as the US interface into Intelsat. But as I said before, that's another topic for another time. On the packet radio net, the challenge was build the, to build the equivalent of ARPANET and have it work in both urban and rural environments, as well as on ships, planes, and on the battlefield. So one of the decisions I made was to use a technology known, and I apologize to those of you who are not, not familiar with this, it was known as direct sequence spread spectrum. Now many people found that to be a, an offensive term, but um, it had been conceived in the 1940s and had been completely impractical to implement at the time. Um, so having decided to use that technology, I had to figure out some way to implement it in a cost-effective cost fashion, which we soon succeeded in doing. I also envisioned using microprocessors to control the radios, since that proposed another challenge. Uh, since the only uh, microprocessor that was available at the time was the 4-bit Intel 4004, which had just been released but was not powerful enough. Again, we don't have to, I don't have the time to explain why four bits wasn't enough to manage, <laughs> but there it was. Um, a bigger challenge was how to successfully demonstrate that this spread spectrum technology, which involved spreading the power of very large bandwidths, um, could not interfere with the existing systems because of this spread of power. My argument was because we were spreading it, there was less, less energy in any, any band that might be used by an existing system, and therefore they should be able to coexist. Um, so we were able to, to do this. Um, it was a real challenge, and 
I timed that out. It took me over a half an hour just to explain <laughs> how we managed to do that. So you can maybe deal with that in the Q&A if you want. <laughs> Although we don't have that much time. Another challenge was to identify a compelling application for the packet radio technology that could facilitate its adoption by the military services. That was another challenge, but the approach we adopted was an advanced airload planning capability for use on the runway, an interactive capability, which was actually deployed with the 82nd Airborne for rapid deployment capability at Fort Bragg. Once again, the internet challenge was to achieve interoperability across these multi multiple networks, creating the possibility of a global information infrastructure that was actually achieved and continues to evolve to this day. So I'd like to close my remarks by briefly mentioning two other developments, both of which involved innovative infrastructure of a different kind. One was part of a VLSI architecture and design program I started at DARPA that was intended to enable semiconductor chips to be designed by researchers initially in universities and to be fabricated cost-effectively and available in a matter of weeks. It was called MOSIS, um, M-O-S-I-S, for MLS implementation system, and it's still providing that support service to users across the world today. One big challenge here was convincing the limited number of semiconductor industry participants, again, as with the internet, this is actually a good idea. You know, to the universities it seemed that way, but not to the industry. They viewed chip design and fabrication at the time as the domain of physicists and material scientists rather than computer scientists or engineers. A second challenge was to allay the fears of the fabrication sites known as foundries that may be harmed, that thought they may be harmed in making use of their facilities available to the research community. But again, that's another story for another day. The last infrastructure development and one in which I've been very personally involved is the digital object architecture, which provides a means of managing information represented in digital form and structured as digital objects, which have, th have three important properties in this architecture. One, unique persistent identifiers for each digital object that should be as applicable 100 years from now as it is today, that are independent of semantics and location. Second is interoperability of digital objects, so they can talk to each other. Um, and and with, with the arbitrary information systems that present themselves as digital objects, allowing for those information systems, arbitrary ones from different manufacturers, to in interact with each other as well. And finally, to provide for security at the digital object itself independent of the means of access. So we're not talking about encrypting lines or anything else. We're talking about having the information itself be protected. This architecture involves computer protocols that resolve identifiers to relevant information, call it state information, about the digital objects, like where they may be accessed, in whatever systems, now or in the future. And thus, different information systems using identifiers can communicate their intention between each other by means of these protocols. Only identifiers, it's an interesting notion. The challenge here, I believe, is to cultivate experimental applications to this infrastructure and architecture at a time when industry, particularly in the US, has other short-term views of what's actually needed, and therefore global adoption of such an important technology almost surely requires understanding upfront of the associated governance issues, a challenging proposition at best. Now, unlike networking, which could be done and people wanted to be part of it, we're talking here about information that may be owned by individuals, companies, uh, universities, and they have a lot of interest in understanding how that's gonna be used, by whom, and for what purposes. 
So I guess my time is over. So in closing, let me just say again how much I really appreciate receiving the James Madison Medal from Princeton University. And I look forward to many more years of productive interactions with the university and its faculty and students, as well as the wider community that's receptive to the possibilities afforded by information, infrastructure, uh, writ, writ large. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Khan, for that really, really wonderful presentation. We now have time for some questions. Um, before asking your questions, I do ask that you wait before someone with the mic comes over to you. In the back. Thank you, Doctor, uh, for an excellent presentation and for enabling me to call Hong Kong on WhatsApp uh, last night on my cell phone. <laughs> Can you understand? For all the great achievements that you have fostered and uh, enabled for all of us, what do you, and in light of our next speaker's uh, inevitable discussion, what do you worry about uh, now that you look back as to the fundamental security risks of the internet, uh, wide open as it is and so on? I'm thinking of, uh, I guess, the Armageddon of an electrical magnetic pulse bomb that could take us all out. What do you worry about, and uh, what should we be thinking about? OK, I, I'm not sure I got that full question, but I think the end, end of it asked what, what I was thinking about and what I'm most worried about. Did I get that right? Yes, partly. In terms of the security, security. of the internet uh, that you have so nobly developed. Well, let me, let me say that um, there's probably no subject that's been more difficult and more um, misunderstood than the issue of security. Going back even to the original days of the ARPANET, um, I was responsible for uh, dealing with security in those early days, and we had a plan for doing end-to-end -end security. Um, but in order to make it relevant in the military, we, we needed help from people who were responsible for that sort of things. The military wouldn't have used it without that support. Uh, and quite frankly, no one knew that this technology of packet switching was going to be relevant uh, at the time. And so given an overloaded and underfunded uh, group of people that I needed to help, they were not able to do that until they knew this was real. And so they declined uh, to be able to help. Well, we had an idea of how to do that with end-to-end -end encryption, and they agreed to at least loan us some equipment that we could use. I went to them with a, a rather heretical suggestion that we build a bypass around these cryptographic devices. So even though you were sending information in the clear on one side, it was all encrypted on the other side, but, but you needed to say to the network where to send it. And if the only interface was through a cryptographic device, you couldn't do that. So I wanted an 8-bit bypass so we could talk to up to 256 different pla places, one by one, and explain where to send the packets. That didn't fly very well in the face of uh, known security practices for many reasons. But about, oh, I would say six weeks later, I got a call from a fellow who was dealing with, and now has an auditorium named after him. He's that well known in that particular part of the Defense Department. I called me up and said, they have a good idea. Would I be willing to accept a five-bit bypass? <laughs> which I said, sure, because that at least it's 32 places, which is more than we ever had. And so we actually built that that technology, but it took a long time after that before the DOD would actually adopt it for widespread use. And that's a whole other story there where 
I didn't get into before, where I, I had to chair a blue ribbon panel for the, what was then called the Defense Communication Agency to um, uh, advise the director of DCA, who was an Air Force uh, Lieutenant General, uh, on what, what decisions to make about a procurement they were making. And uh, let me just leave it at the fact that um, they went through that process, they did their work, and eventually they adopted the ARPANET technology uh, in place of what they had procured um, because it just was a, a really good choice for the DOD. Today, my concern is that um, security was not something we had enough knowledge about. I mean, the short-term deliverables were to build this network and show you could connect computers. Today, I would start with the digital object architecture and basically say, for security purposes, tell every digital object what parameters needed to apply to it. So if there are only certain individuals that can access it, you know, and every individual is represented by a digital object that knows its coordinates and maybe public keys and things like that, you can say, make this object available only to the following individuals and by identifier, and that can be tested by the system and so you'd have a public-private key interchange or use whatever security technology of the future is involved. So you can actually validate whether this was the person that's involved with, with cryptographic security and do it right at the information level. So it didn't matter whether you were encrypting the lines or the networks were protected because the information itself was carrying that out. Now you might ask, well, can we trust the operating systems? You know, does Microsoft have some back doors that can be invoked to get around that. That's a whole other area that, that involves the security of the underlying system that's running the programs and supporting the objects. But, you know, can you trust cloud services today? I mean, the federal government does, and they have a whole process for evaluating the security of those places. But it ultimately involves trust that the parties who have the ability to get to the back doors in those systems won't exploit them for nefarious purposes. And so it's a challenge. It's going to be a challenge with us forever. There is no security apparatus in the world that can't be compromised in some way because it's ultimately dependent on people and what people do. And uh, that, that's, that's essentially where we stand today. Here. Dr. Khan. Um, is this working? Yes. Dr. Khan. We're blinded uh, <laughs> up here in case you can't see. We can't. I love this notion of digital object architecture and maybe thinking as a future archaeologist, right, 100, 200, 300 years from now. Should we allow certain digital objects to die or should we always have everything that is produced accumulate into the future? So <laughs> I would never argue that we should preserve everything forever, um, despite the fact that I keep a lot of papers around that I probably shouldn't <laughs> forever. Um, but uh, that's a choice that one can make. I mean, what to forget about, what not to forget about. Um, I think much of the information that will be created is going to be personal. I mean, I, I'm not a believer in the mantra that people have often articulated that in information wants to be free. Um, I don't think your health records want to be free. I don't think your bank information wants to be free. The government would certainly argue that not all government information wants to be free. Um, but you also want, don't want to put impediments on the ability to access information that you want shared. You ought to be able to share information in more controlled ways than just making it available to everyone. But you know, more importantly, I think we need to have a better understanding of how to manage information. You know, one of the one of the things I turned down in the early days of uh, well, the early 1990s, when there was a fellow uh, at CERN who had been building something called that came to be known as the World Wide Web. And he wanted to run the consortium out of my organization because we were dealing with the whole national community. We knew industry, we knew academia, 
certainly knew the government. And the first question I posed to him was, how are you going to keep control over the kind of information? You don't have the spread of widespread disinformation. And so that led to a very long-term discussion, which we never resolved because MIT jumped in and decided to host it anyway. Um, I think they've now backed away from that. And uh, even the creator of the web is no longer a big supporter of even web 3.0 because it didn't go the way he had anticipated. You have to assume that every technology has its good side and bad side. Fire is great for heating, if you consider that a technology, but it can burn things down. Automobiles, great for transportation, but they can affect the climate and then people can have accidents. So there's a dual side for every technology that you create. And I just wanted to deal with some of these issues up front. Um, so it, it, it's a good question, but uh, I certainly think it's going to be a choice that one has to make rather than a blanket statement, keep everything forever or, or not. One last question over here. With the hand up. Yeah, thank you, doctor, for your, for your presentation. Um, I was reading an, uh, an essay the other day by, by a guy named Robert Breedlove, and the title of the essay was Zero and Bitcoin. And his point was, or his belief, and uh, what the essay was about, was um, his belief that Bitcoin is uh, as important a uh, technology as zero, as the, the invention of zero how many thousands of years ago. And uh, so I was wondering if, uh, if you have considered uh, blockchain and what your thoughts are about it. <laughs> you know, I've, I've given keynote talks at multiple blockchain conferences, including the first one in Washington, D.C., and I think it was 2018, I did one in Australia, one in Mexico. And when I was first invited to keynote the blockchain conference, I said, no, I think it's not a good idea because the, the view of almost everyone there is that blockchain was a brand new construct uh, and, and I don't view it that way. I said, there's a, there's a long history and a lot of context. And they said, no, look, people would love to hear it. I was on, under the impression that I get rotten tomatoes thrown at me if I ever tried to tell that to a thousand zealots in the audience. <laughs> but I agreed to do the first one and it didn't happen that way. In fact, it came up to me later and I explained the history of it going back to the, you know, the original space thing where we would, the space program where, you know, we had blocks of information that were chained together in order to not have to wait for round trip times of seconds or minutes in case there were errors. Uh, to computer programming where blocks in, in computer languages are tied together in ways so that you can, you know, program in a more effective way to, um, essentially the digital object architecture. So when I look at something like blockchain and say, what's a block? Those blocks are really essentially digital objects, if you think about it. In 2001, uh, this is an idea that my, my wife actually had, who's a, a, a copyright lawyer and is sitting in the audience up there. She suggested you know, that we tell people that digital object architecture is not just something you can use for copyright works like publications and, and library materials and even things like songs and movies and chip, semiconductor chip designs, those are all digital in which there are rights. Um, and not all the same kinds of rights, but they're all rights protected by law. What about digital objects that simply have value? And all the cryptocurrencies are basically digital objects that have value associated with them. So we wrote a paper in 2001, it was called um, uh, Representing Value as Digital Objects. You know, I commend that to you. It was 
I was later invited to give a talk on the subject at the University of Colorado by the then Dean of Law School, who is now the Attorney General of the State of Colorado. And he, he edited a journal called, uh, the Journal of, uh, I think it was called uh, Communications and High Technology Law or, or Information Technology and, and Law, something like that. And they published it in 2006. So I commend that to you. Look on the internet, you'll find that paper. And it made the argument that uh, you can have value in digital objects and Oh, by the way, here is how you can transfer a digital object from one person to another, just like a dollar bill. And here's how you can do it with anonymity as well, just like you can with a dollar bill. We set up a foundation in Geneva in 2014 to help places around the world make use of the digital object architecture that were unwilling or unable to rely on a US uh, rooted system. Because we, we control the root of the system much as you would see other parties controlling certain roots of the internet today. And so we let that go. We moved it to this organization in, in Geneva. But as part of that, we set up a mechanism by which organizations around the globe could actually participate in the management of that system and they shared information using a kind of blockchain, more efficient than any of the current blockchains, and one in which you didn't necessarily require that everything be kept around forever. If you talk to some of the computer companies, they'll tell you that you know, using blockchains to keep track of things in their file system is very cumbersome, to say the least. Uh, but I don't see blockchain as a new construct. I, I simply see it as one that was articulated as one that didn't have any central management, which wasn't true either, because somebody's got to be able to change the crypto code, somebody's got to be able to agree on what consensus mechanisms make sense. So I really think it's just an evolution. You can link digital objects to other digital objects, you can have various ways of dealing with the transfer with anonymity, and I wrote that up in, in those early papers. There's also a paper that was, you can find on the internet too, as part of something like America's future cyber, cyber power, or something like that. Something like that. I, I uh, edited that journal art with uh, Joe Nye, who's been running the Kennedy Center at Harvard and a former uh, director of national intelligence, head of NSA. And the paper I wrote there was uh, the role of architecture in internet defense. And I was trying to explain how the digital object architecture could be used to deal with all of the, these kind of cybersecurity threats. We later proposed a number of efforts to deal with that, like in, in managing the energy grid in this country so that it couldn't be uh, you know, compromised by people trying to send uh, bogus information into the, into the plants. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting question. I've never been a fan of blockchain, particularly. I don't think it's very practical. If everything has to be kept around forever, it's very cumbersome, it's not terribly efficient, and you know that the Bitcoin efforts have been undermined by all the demand on power generation um, that, that, uh, that are required to just, just mine Bitcoins. There are other approaches to it, but ultimately there needs to be a role for the central governments in, in coining these, these funds is an effort underway. We've been dealing with people in the Federal Reserve to try and get them to better understand. I think there are some folks in that system that think their digital optic architecture is the right way to define a uh, uh, central bank digital currency. And we'll see how this plays out. These are not things you can force from on, on high necessarily. In every case, you've got to get buy-in from different parts of society that are willing to use it. Some countries have already decided to go down that route, and I think they may regret those choices. But if they're right, we'll all learn something from it. And that's the advantage of having diversity and allowing various things to be tried out in different, different places. So thank you for that question. With that, please join me again in thanking Dr. Khan.